So I want to uh, do three albums and three stories. Uh, three different albums are not necessarily related. These, these really aren't at all. Um, just three records that I've been either listening to recently or um, pulled out because I've got an interesting story around them. But uh, first one I want to talk about, I got introduced to this at my friend Diana's place. Um, I was staying there. She lives in Oakland. She lives in this um, really nice old Victorian house and I was staying in her front room. And um, I'd always, always heard of Ricky Lee, Lee Jones, but I had never really heard Ricky Lee Jones. The album is Pirates. It came out in 1981. I was surprised. Listening to it, I thought it was the 70s um, until I just was getting ready for this video. But the story around it's really interesting. I mean, she, she went out with Tom Waits. They were long-term partners. And if you look at this cover, you know, the, the, the guy on the cover looks an awful lot like Tom Waits, right? You turn it over in the back and it, the picture, you know, doesn't totally look like him. But the similarity on the front is, is undeniable. And the album is really, especially the first song, We Belong Together. And then there's another song later on, A Lucky Guy. I mean, these are just direct um, comments on the, on the uh, end of that relationship or what they had. Uh, the styles are very similar to... Her style is very similar to his 70s uh, jazz poet style. Um, yeah, I think they're really creative partners. And I, from my understanding, she got into uh, drugs and, and was living a pretty uh, reckless life for a little while. And, and that's why they had to go their separate ways. I don't know a lot about Ricky Lee Jones. I've always been really intrigued by her. I started exploring a little bit online on streaming services, uh, some of her more recent album. She did one in the mid nineties that was really blowing me away. It's based on, um, on, uh, some new interpretation of the Bible, I guess. And she, she ran with it and did this kind of impromptu, uh, album, which sounded really good. You can't get it on vinyl. I, I don't have the name of it with me right now, but pirates is, is, is really interesting. The thing that I, I'm intrigued by it more than I'm like into it. And I'm intrigued by her. Um, the sound of the drums kind of drives me nuts and it does have that jazz hipster kind of thing. She almost has like a little girl voice, which I'm not especially fond of, but I'm really curious about her as a songwriter and as an album I plan on digging into more as well as some of her other uh, albums. The other one I want to talk about is um, Pink Floyd. This live album, this came out in, came out recently, I think, just a few years ago, 2019. I'm not a fan of waterless Pink Floyd. Uh, I love Pink Floyd. I have tons of, I have all the records. I'm, I mean, I've heard them all and I think I have all, I think I have all of them on vinyl. Um, all of them I'm interested in anyway. I'm, I'm really not interested in the, in the um, David Gilmore led Pink Floyd. That version of the band came out when I was getting into Pink Floyd. Uh, so a momentary lapse of reason is definitely something I listen to a lot. I think by the time the Division Bell came out, I just didn't care. And I didn't really care when they went on tour either. It just, just didn't seem to be uh, particularly interesting to me without Roger Waters. So when, when I when I kind of inherited this record recently, I wasn't that excited about it. Although I had a former coworker who was who was quite into it. She's, she's a lot younger and was getting into Pink Floyd. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, I'll approach this. It's, it's a really nice package, um, double vinyl. Uh, the concert was in 1990, and apparently it was kind of between uh, tours. It was just kind of this uh, standalone gig. So I was I put it on one day when I was uh, fixing lunch, put it on my turntable, and I thought, oh, it's just going to sound like like uh, Division or um, what were the live albums? Delicate Sound of Thunder, and then there was one called Pulse. It just had that blinking light that never went off apparently on CD. I had Delicate. Sound of Thunder, and I, I probably listened to it once. I had it on cassette, it was like two tapes. So I was expecting this to just sound like, I don't know, boring versions of Shine on Your Crazy Diamond, The Great Gig in the Sky, Wish You Were Here, Sorrow, Money, Comfortably Numb, and Run Like Hell. Um, but I put it on, and I, I remember like making my lunch and being like, this sounds really good. They took some chances with this. This does not sound the way that I would expect this to sound, like a like a bloated band just going through their set. And I was really intrigued, and I was like excited about it. I wanted to tell people about it, and get people excited about it. You know, the same way I was. And then the vocals came in, and it sounded like Chipmunks. And then I realized I had it on the wrong speed. So it is just another boring live record 
the water was Pink Floyd. But put it on 45 if you have it. Play it for a little while before the vocals come in. I thought it was really interesting. The third album I have is came out as a double album, but it's really two standalone records. And I was researching this a little bit recently, and apparently uh, he wanted, the artist wanted these records to be seen as two individual records. You know, I think maybe he could have released one and then another one six months later, but gave his fans a, a pretty good deal, packaging them together. I'm talking about Nick Cave, Abattoir Blues, and The Liar of Orpheus. Um, yeah, he had said, you know, buy one, listen to it, or bu buy the albums, listen to one, then, you know, a year later, listen to another one, you know, so they're kind of standalone. Unfortunately, you know, they, they came out together, they get packaged together, um, they get toured, they get toured together, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to separate them. The packaging has always been really nice. I had the CD for years, um, kind of a linen, soft linen kind of box with the discs in it and I just recently got the um, vinyl and it's, it's similar it's a, it's a nice package it's uh, kind of textured and has a two records on it but I thought I would listen to it a little bit differently I listened to it all the way through like once or twice but now I'm really trying to listen to those albums as separate albums so I just want to talk about the liar of Orpheus so this is uh, the second album if you buy you know Avatar Blues liar of Orpheus and apparently Nick Cave worked with two different drummers two different drummers in the bad seeds there's more they were coming up when they did this big batch of material there's one that was more like rock oriented and there's another drummer that was more jazzy so he separated them into two batches of songs liar of orpheus is the more jazzy drummer uh it's a little bit more stripped down it has some rock songs on it a little bit but not like liar or not like abattoir blues instead you have uh songs like breathless um, which he's pl been playing again lately. For One of the issues I have with Nick Cave Live is he tends to play his new album and then old, old songs, the hits, the stuff from the 80s and early 90s, and ignore a lot of the albums that came between. Um, but it seems like recently when he, when he played with the Bad Seas in Europe, he was playing a lot of songs from this collection of songs. But Liar of Orpheus as a standalone record, it'd be really interesting to see that um, kind of reappraised among has other records separate from Avatar Blues. I think personally, I think it's a best, better album. Um, it uh, Breathless is great. Baby Turn Me On is is really just this great kind of uh, very sexual, very sensual song uh, that he wrote. Um, Carry Me, Oh Children. These are like staples of, of that tour that he did. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to see it. He never came through any city I was I was living in at the time. Um, but it's a great album, and I think, I think it has, I think it's got more strength if you view it separately than with Abattoir Blues. I think Abattoir Blues is a great record too, but Liar of Orpheus is a little bit more in that stripped down um, Boatman's Call, a little bit um, no more shall we part, but but different. Um, it's a little bit more of a singer songwriter record than Abattoir Blues is. I think there's less people playing on it. You got that jazz drummer. The other thing that I think is really interesting about this record and, and the other one that came with it is this is sort of the last batch of songs, the last project that Nick Cave did where it was written in the old way. Like the old way Nick Cave used to write records, from my understanding, is he would write all the lyrics out, figure out the structure of it, write the songs, like on a piano usually, and teach the band. For, for most of the songs. After this album, Mick Harvey left, he was in the Bad Seeds founding member. Um, Warren Ellis got significantly elevated and, and Nick Cave started to write with Warren Ellis. He would write out the lyrics, but then they would work on the material together. And that's been sort of the blueprint for every project that Nick Cave has done since then. He's working on a new record and I, I find it interesting to kind of wondering if he'd go back to a, a style like this. I certainly love those records. Push the Sky Away, Skeleton Tree, Ghost Teen took, took me a while, but I, I do love it now. I think it's a very special record. And even um, Carnage, which came out like a year ago, I think is, is a really good late night record. It took me a little while too. And I saw him on that tour and it was just absolutely amazing. There is a new documentary, live show documentary on YouTube. Called, I think it's called Kingdom in the Sky definitely worth watching that was from that tour with with Warren but if you're looking for an album that if you're getting into Nick Cave um, I would highly suggest this album 
and if you do pick it up on, on vinyl or CD, uh, listen to try to listen to them separately. I think their strength is their in, more in their individuality than it is their package together. And I'll probably have another video at some point about Avatar Blues, but I'm really just trying to focus on Liar of Orpheus now. But it's a, it's a great record um, and sort of the last of a certain style for Nick Cave. Uh, but it'll be interesting, like I said, to see what he does with this new record that apparently he's got writer's block a little bit and struggling with. He's very public on his red-handed files or red hand files about this process. So anyway, that's what I've got. Pink Floyd, Ricky Lee Jones, and Nick Cave. Thanks, everyone.